Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for the eighth annual meeting of the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum, hosted by the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, and the New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization. Now, let us begin the technology session two, energy system integration. First, I would like to introduce the moderator for this session, Dr. Yamaji Kenji. Dr. Yamaji is an ICEF steering committee member, president and director general of the Research Institute of Innovative Technology for the Earth, and professor emeritus at the University of Tokyo. The speakers for this session are Professor Nishimura Kiyoshi, guest professor of business engineering at Osaka University. Mr. Carl Alberto Guguliel Minotti, Chief Executive Officer of NHOA. Dr. Luciano Martini, Director of Green Powered Future Mission, Mission Innovation, and Director of Transmission and Distribution Technology Department, Ricelca Sul Sistema Energetico, Italy. Ms. Ijon Bake, PhD candidate of Department of Energy Resources Engineering at Stanford University. Dr. Otsuki Takashi, Senior Researcher of New and Renewa Renewable Energy Group and Electric Power Industry and New and Renewable Energy Unit at the Institute of Energy Economics, Japan. And now I would like to ask Dr. Yamaji to moderate this session. Dr. Yamaji, if you please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me start the technical session two on energy system integration. I'm Kenji Yamaji, and I was asked uh, to be a moderator of this session. Okay, so the scope of the session is a cross-sectoral society-wide energy system integration and for enabling the efficient use of various energies, including not only electric power, but also zero carbon fuels across different sectors. And the latter part of the session, discussion will cover the following aspects from a view to both 2030 and 2050, uh, optimizing electric power supply and demand and technological challenges of sector coupling, including heat, gas, hydrogen, and transport, etc., and uh, social challenge of energy system integration. Uh, fortunately, we can have successfully invited five uh, distinguished speakers, including those from younger generations. So the Professor Kiyoshi Nishimura, guest professor of Osaka University, is from Kansai Electric Power Company. He's uh, participating, actually, I mean he's sitting next to me. And the remaining four speakers are remote participation. Mr. Carl Alberto Guglielo Minotti, he's the CEO of NHOA, probably New Horizon Ahead or something, I think. And uh, Dr. Luciano Martini is the director of the Green Powered Future Mission, Mission Innovation. And Miss, I was told she, she liked to be called EJ, EJ Bake, is a PhD candidate in energy resources engineering, Stanford University. And Dr. Otsuki Takashi, Takashi Otsuki, according to English, uh, senior researcher at the Institute of Energy Economics. And timetables, so my introduction for about five minutes and uh, presentations. I will have a series of five presentations, each presentation five minutes, starting from Professor Kiyoshi Nishimura. And uh, after that, we will have a time of discussion. I will probably ask each uh, uh, speakers, and of course, after that, we will invite uh, question answered from the audience. And uh, lastly, wrap up for me. 
Okay, some supplementary uh, slides. So with sector coupling, sector coupling the keyword of this session, the energy system will evolve from a conventional linear type, uh, it's a left-hand side, to an efficient cyclical type, realizing integration of across sectors and regions on the uh, right-hand side. And the technology trend in energy system integrations. For energy system integration, various efficiency and cost improvements and new technology development and actual operation are being carried out, mainly in power to gas, mobility, heat, and even mobility power probably will be told by uh, Dr. Uh, <laughs> I'm difficult to pronounce his name, but uh, Carl Albert, and uh, optimizing supply and demand of electric power. So there are many technologies. And that is my brief introduction of the session. So let me move to the presentation of each speaker. First speaker is Professor Kiyoshi Nishimura. His, his title is Expanding Demand Side Flexibility for Decarbonized power system in Japan. So, Nishimura-san, please. Thank you, Dr. Yamaji, and I'm Kiyoshi Nishimura, and a presentation on the demand side flexibility. Demand side flexibility is a, a kind of sector coupling from supply side to demand side. And uh, how the demand side flexibility is now growing in the uh, all over the world, and uh, what is uh, what kind of challenge Japan is going to is my presentation. Outline is uh, like this, and the transition of energy system, and what is DSF, and uh, DR and the participation of power system. How to how to integrate the power system is a third point, and the fourth point is a collaboration of the DR business. Firstly, the, it's a great transition from the traditional model to hybrid model. Uh, this is uh, about, it occurred in about these 10, uh, ten years. So the centralized three-phase electric power system is uh, invented by Nikola Tesla or Samuel Insel over 100 years ago, and it, was, uh, it had been making great success, and it uh, little by little changed to the hybrid model. Hybrid model, uh, what means is uh, renewable power and batteries and uh, uh, electric vehicle. Electric vehicle is a uh, uh, sector company for trans transportation and energy. And uh, this kind of uh, uh, great transition is now uh, going on in the all over the world, including Japan. So that in that case, rapid increase of uh, renewable power and uh, it will uh, it, it was greatly changing European and California and other companies. And always the uh, uh, renewable powers increasing uh, requires the flexibility, uh, like the Delta Kilowatt. Uh, Delta Kilowatt is, had been made by the supply side of the gas turbine and uh, uh, traditional uh, fossil fuel plant. And uh, we require the new uh, flexibility by demand side, batteries, uh, electric vehicles, and the demand responses. These are names in the demand side flexibility. And it is a, a feature image uh, figured by METI uh, in, this, this, in this summer. And this is a rotary uh, le legacy generators, renewable powers, and uh, it is com uh, combined and the optimization of the generators and uh, go through to the downside. It's a legacy model and the newly uh, building model is, uh, uh, it was advanced system operation, including the demand side, batteries, EVs, and the fossil fuel, all the demand side flexibility is joined in the new system. Uh, this is a hybrid model of Japan and uh, uh, so that the whole system is from the legacy model to hybrid model. Uh, what causes these transitions? One is the de decentralization, spread of DER. All the customers have the 
distributed energy resources, uh, REs, batteries, and uh, these are uh, becoming to the flexibility. And the decarbonization is the main theme of RCEF, and uh, carbon neutral is the key factor of the, all the things. And diversification is also important. That uh, uh, devices and RE generators and uh, IoT things that are produced had been produced in the basically the developed countries, but now changed to the all the uh, developing countries all over the world. That, that this figure, uh, this photo is at the Shenzhen in China, and uh, very excellent devices and the new DR devices are produ produced in the developing countries now. So in Japan, the demand side flexibility is started from the Great Earthquake of 2011, and it starts by the demand response. Demand response is occurred, uh, was studied in the two, through 2012 to 2015. At, uh, it is implemented in the power system in 2016. And on the other hand, the VPP project started in the 2016 by five years, and uh, now it's uh, uh, the demand side challenge of the flexibility in Japan was being, had been <coughs> accelerated in just five years. So BPP uh, project is uh, and it's a, a figure image that uh, many appliances and many demand side resources are gathered uh, to make a function uh, instead a substitution of the legacy generators and it can make a demand response megawatts of the delta kilowatts. So and from 2021, it, uh, it particularly introduction of the power system, the various markets, and basically when the sector coupling of the supply side revenue of energy to the demand side uh, uh, distributed energy resources. Now, it is the challenge now, just to start this year. So in the European case, is the most developed world of the many demand, <coughs> demand side resources. And uh, in the, these uh, venture, venture companies in European are very active. And uh, uh, the f uh, some are making, uh, uh, some are utilizing the electric vehicle, and some are using the water heaters, some are batteries and uh, embedded generators. And, uh, some of them uh, originally from the California and other companies. So they uh, uh, use their, their uh, intermarket, intermarket wholesale market and uh, monetize to the, all the uh, DRs and it can make the sector coupling to the renewable power to the demand side flexibility. In Japan, it's, uh, we are now challenging uh, Japan's regulators and uh, academies and business are now challenging to utilize all the DERs, but now it is on the way now. So Delta Kilowatt is a reserve market is still, uh, in Japan is still in the uh, building, building step. So we are now studying to much more, for much more monetize of the DERs. And Inter Kilowatt hour market is uh, uh, a very small now. And uh, uh, in Japan, the capacity market is now uh, little by little. Uh, <coughs> growing, and demand side, DSO, DSO flexibility is a very important matter in Europe, and uh, in Japan, uh, just started to build. So, uh, uh, this is all of my presentation, and uh, in Japan, that uh, flexibility is a key word, and then uh, the key sector of the sector coupling through the uh, renewable power's expansion now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, much Professor Nishin Shimolabara. Next is uh, Mr. Carl Aragueto Gurugri Minotti. Uh, his uh, presentation title is VGI Technology Turning EVs in a Resource or the European Power Grid. So, Carl Aragueto, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carlo Alberto Guglielminotti, Chief Executive Officer of NOR. I'm really honored to join this panel today to, to present to you how we applied and will apply even more in the future vehicle to grid te integrated technologies to the e mobility sector in Europe. Let me start by introducing you, NOAA, and uh, 
in just a few words, let me say. NOAA stands for New Horizons Ahead. And we develop technologies enabling the global transition towards clean energy and sustainable mobility, shaping the future of a next generation living in harmony with our planet. We are one of the world leaders in energy storage and e-mobility and certainly worldwide pioneers in microgrids. Creating a, a microgrid means uh, combining the different sources of energy, energy supply typically distributed from solar and hydroelectric to batteries to provide energy. In the field of electric mobility, we apply the know-how and intellectual property asset we have developed over 15 years, our first patent goes back to 2005, of research and development of microgrids to electric vehicle batteries. And there is a little difference whether a battery is inside a container or a car. Since in reality, car batteries are not on the move for 95% of the time, so they can be used for a stationary application. Consider that in the next 10 years, in Europe, we would would be sold approximately 52 million electric vehicles. When all connected to the power grid, that will mean some, something very simple. Around 900 gigawatt hours of power connected 95% of the time to the electrical grid, as to say 18 times the peak output of the Italian power system and 70% of the installed power expected in Europe by 2030. Therefore, 70% of the instantaneous power, let's say capacity, of the European electrical system will be able to be delivered by electric vehicles. You can now see that this makes vehicle grid integrated, so-called VGI or V2G technologies, and the no if or buts, a decisive technology for the whole balancing and stability within the European electricity market. VGI bidirectional technologies means that the car can be used to support and stabilize the network, transforming a potential problem of over-demand within the network caused by EVs into a valuable opportunity. And our ambition is to install VGI technologies in every highway, in every urban area, in every parking lot, supermarket, every company with an electric corporate fleet. As we started with our V2G project in Italy, what we say with Stellantis uh, in their iconic Mirafiori plant, uh, where the new Fiat 500 is manufactured. Indeed, in September 2020, NOAA, at the time, and EPS, inaugurated with Stellantis and Terna, which is the largest European grid operator, the largest worldwide vehicle to grid project. Where we started with 32 V2G fast charging points capable of connecting 64 vehicles for a capacity of 2 megawatt, aimed at piloting the technology and managing the logistics of the storage area. And at completion, which is beginning of next year, we'll interconnect up to 700 electric vehicles and couple second life batteries providing 25 megawatt ultra fast frequency regulation services to the Italian and European grid, thanks to the synchronous interconnection. In addition to this iconic V2G project, on July 23, we unveiled our master plan through 2030 with a new ambitious project, Atlante, which is the largest Southern European EV fast charging network and the first enabled by renewables, energy storage, and 100% grid integrated thanks to our V2G technology. Then the ambition is to develop by 2025 in over 1,500 sites, 5,000 VGI fast chargers integrated with storage, solar, and the grid. And by 2030, 9,000 9, charging stations with over 35,000 VGI fast chargers. Well, if you notice, the Atlante project is timely in the context of the adoption by the European Commission on July 14 this year of the Fit for 55 package, which is uh, anticipating a paradigm change in Europe. 100% zero emission cars registered as of 2035 
and installation of charging and fueling points on major highways every 60 kilometers in Europe by 2035. Our Charging stations will be fully integrated in iconic local microgrids with storage solutions and renewable energy sources to optimize charging costs and vehicle-to-grid integration services. Of course, depending on size configuration, we will not only install fast chargers, but we will couple with first stationary storage, batteries with over 100 kilowatt hours of capacity to facilitate vehicle to grid services. Then second, additional renewable energy through solar panels integrated with the canopies, which is very useful also for a more convenient charge. And third, second life batteries to ensure a cost-effective setup and the circularity and sustainability of 100% of our e-mobility plan. I mean, any charging station will be a real microgrid perfectly integrated with the national grid, storage, and renewable power. And that they will be all interconnected virtually, constituting the largest virtual power plant ever developed, thanks to our iconic energy management system that has over 15 years of optimization and algorithms and microgrid management techniques. So in just a few words, this is the Atlante project which represent the next ambitious step to accelerate the transition to electric mobility, enhance the renewable penetration through integrated storage technologies, and if I may, eventually make the world a better place for the future generations. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a very persuading presentation, I think. Uh, Mr. Carl Alberto Guglielmo Minotti, thank you very much. The next presenter is uh, Dr. Luciano Martini. He will talk about the Green Powered Future Mission. Please, Luciano Martini. Good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you to the organizer for giving us this uh, great opportunity to present the Green Power Future Mission to this uh, nice audience and important event. Uh, next, please. The Green Power Future Mission, also called Power Mission, was launched uh, uh, this July during the SEM12 Mission Innovation 6 Ministerial hosted by Chile in the framework of Mission Innovation Phase 2. Uh, the Power Mission is led by China, Italy, and the UK, and is also involving uh, several uh, Mission Innovation countries, and in particular also Japan as a strong support. Next click, please. In this case, you see that uh, we are based on a public-private partnership where we have not only mission innovation country, we have also international organizations like IRENA, uh, the IA, and the World Bank, and also some very important key actors from the private sector. It's important to mention that uh, the power uh, sector is responsible for a large fraction of the emission, of the global emission, and uh, according to IA, those emissions need to be strongly re be reduced by 80% in the next couple of decades. It's also important to say that according to IRENA, is, uh, we plan to have that 86% uh, of the demand that will be matched by the VRE, so viable renewable energy sources. So there is a massive integration of renewables in our system that poses some important challenges. That's why flexibility is also a key word for our mission. In, our goal is also to make possible that the power system around the world in different geography and the climate can be run affordably and reliably with up to 100% VRE. Next, please. In this slide, you see the main aim of our power mission. So as I said, by 2030, we want to demonstrate innovative solution that they be allowing different power systems to be run around the world with up to 100% variable renewable energy sources. To do that, we plan to uh, make some feasibility study and also to launch uh, both pilot and larger demonstrators in order to really validate solutions that will be applicable around the world and so highly replicable. 
we are paying attention to technical solution, but not only. Our mission is also paying attention to all the other no barrier also related to non-technical issue. In some sense, we want to really explore uh, new market design, new business model, and also how the regulatory framework should be evolving in order to allow the innovation to take place. It's important that we not only look to application in developed country, but we also look to developing country, because it's important that we allow the, this country to use uh, innovative technology and not to be located with the past technology based on carbon uh, resources and fuels. Thank you. Next, please. Coming to system integration, I would like to say that our mission is uh, organized around the three different RNI pillars. The first one is about affordable and reliable DRE technologies. And the second one is uh, really paying attention to flexibility, all type of flexibility that are needed to really increase the amount of variable renewable energy sources that are integrated in our system from short flexibility, uh, mid-term flexibility, and long-term flexibility. So different solution using all possible solution available in the system in order to maximize the amount uh, of uh, renewable to be integrated. Then the third pillar is actually really focusing on system integration and everything related to data and digitalization that makes system integration possible. So for us, system integration, energy system integration is really an important aspect that entail all the three mission pillars. It also is fundamental to reach uh, what is believe uh, our main goal, 100% DRE in power system by 2030. Next, please. When we talk about flexibility, so pillar two, we really look at the additional uh, possibility uh, to unlock uh, uh, flexibility from different parts of the system in order to make uh, the integration of variable renewable energy sources possible. In this case, we dedicated an entire RNI theme to flexibility and integration, and we devote uh, our activity to technology and solution that made the sector coupling possible. So we know that by developing the right interfaces, we can really make a, a good interface between the power sector and other energy vectors, in particular, the energy sector regarding the power to gas. is a very popular at this stage, power to hydrogen and green molecules. But also, as has been mentioned by the previous speaker, the important aspect related to uh, electromobility, so the possibility to really have a, a smart charging a vehicle to grid functionality supporting the grid. Finally, also uh, having heat pumps uh, for heating and cooling of building, this could be another source of flexibility. And to allow the, all of that, as you can see in the next slide, uh, you need a really digital platform, a data sharing platform available. So next slide, please. Yes, in this case, in pillar three, we really look to everything is needed to really make uh, this connection and interaction possible. This is to find uh, uh, possibility for increase of servability of a system and also to collect real-time data that need to be exchanged across different sectors. That's why we need an interoperable uh, platform for data sharing and for system operation optimization. This will also allow the, for new actors to act on new market that will be made possible uh, to acquire, to bid for flexibility service uh, in real time. So our goal in this case for Pillar 3 is really to make and validate innovative solution for a new kind of adaptive architecture for interoperable data exchange and effective system integration in the, our system abroad. Thank you. Next slide. So what, what I said at the beginning that our goal is not just to make simulation and study in our labs, but also to launch a very large demo around the world using the voluntary approaches that are from the 14 countries so far that join our mission. The main idea is that uh, we want to have a really an international cooperation where demonstration will be needed to really prove that viable solutions are not only possible, but also applicable. 
the main idea is really to collect a, a, a number of these innovations, innovative solutions, and then each country will be able to select the solution that is more appropriate according to their energy mix, their uh, um, the geography, and all the aspects that, that related to their power system. Okay, I think I, I concluded my presentation. Next slide, please. So thank you very much for your attention and I will be very much willing to contribute to the discussion. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Martini. Okay, next is uh, Ms. E.J. Bake. She's talking about decarbonizing California's grid, integration of green technologies. So E.J., please. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm excited to be here and to be part of the discussion to follow. Today, I'll be discussing decarbonizing California's grid, integration of clean technologies. Just to provide some context on California, California currently has an executive order in place which commits California to a carbon neutral economy by 2045. The figure on the left shows the sources of emissions, and notably, the electricity sector accounts for 15% of economy-wide emissions. Now, while the direct emissions from the electricity sector is relatively small, decarbonizing the electricity sector and electrifying other end uses of energy, such as transportation, commercial, residential, and even some parts of the industrial sector will have significant carbon reduction potential. Because decarbonizing large parts of the economy will depend on the electricity sector, it is crucial that decarbonizing the electricity sector be done cost effectively. In recognizing the importance of the electricity sector, California passed Senate Bill 100, which established a 100% clean energy grid goal by 2045. Today, California's energy mix consists heavily of natural gas, as shown on the right, which will have to be decarbonized into the future. So to assess different technologies and pathways towards decarbonizing the grid, we use a capacity expansion and dispatch model. We use an open source model called ERBS, and the link is available there on the bottom. And ultimately, the model designs a future grid that minimizes total system costs. And here, system costs are the cost of investing in new capacity to meet future load and policy goals, as well as the cost of operating the grid on an annual basis. And so the model is incredibly detailed in that it simulates the entire year in hourly time steps to ensure that the newly built system is reliable. And so with this model, we assess a wide range of technologies and we come away with three main conclusions. First, with the development of clean firm resources, California can cost effectively reach a net zero carbon grid. Now, clean firm resources are resources such as nuclear, gas with carbon capture and storage, and zero carbon fuels, whose operation and availability does not depend on weather patterns like wind and solar does. The reason these resources are needed is because intermittent resources such as PV and wind not only have daily variability, but also seasonal, which means there might be days or weeks with very low generation from these resources. And so clean firm resources are available year long and can sure ensure reliability without having to overbuild the system. And so what we find is that any single clean firm resource, whether that be nuclear, gas with CCS, or zero carbon fuels can play this role. Moreover, these technologies don't necessarily compete with each other, they actually complement each other to achieve the most cost savings when existing in a system together. Second, we also analyzed long duration storage technologies. And what we found is that when short and long duration storage technologies are operated synergistically, system costs can be reduced by half relative to systems without long duration storage. 
And when we say synergistically, we mean that long duration storage plays a seasonal role, as shown on the top left figure there, while short duration storage plays a diurnal role. Now, as long duration storage gets more expensive, as shown from left to right here, you see that less of it is used. And so short duration storage starts operating seasonally, which ultimately increases system costs. Now, we find that the benchmark for long duration storage to operate synergistically is approximately $5 per kilowatt hour. Finally, we analyze the role that flexible load management can have in decarbonizing energy systems. And we find that while flexible load cannot displace the need for clean firm resources, having it in the system can help reduce system cost largely by displacing the need for energy storage. And on the left, you'll see how having more flexible load reduces the need for energy storage. As an approximation, having approximately 20% of a peak load be shiftable in a given day results in system costs reduced by 13%. So while it's not as much as clean firm resources or affordable long duration storage, flexible load management is, can still be very valuable to decarbonizing the system. And so with that, I'll conclude the presentation by sharing this map of California's energy infrastructure which really emphasizes the fact that this is a system-wide challenge. We really need to develop and deploy all the resources that we can get to ensure reliable and affordable decarbonization of the grid in a timely manner. On the right are some publications where the results came from today. And please feel free to reach out to me in the email listed with any questions or comments. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, EJ. So the next and the last speak, uh, presenter is Dr. Takashi Otsuki. He will talk about the power to Mesan, prospects and challenges in Japan. So Dr. Otsuki, please. Hello, I'm Takashi Otsuki, senior researcher at the Institute of Energy Economics Japan, IEEJ. It's an honor to speak in this meeting. My presentation focuses on prospects and challenges for part two gas, especially methane synthesis, which would contribute to integrating the electricity and heat sectors in Japan. Synthetic methane produced from CO2 and renewable-based hydrogen is an option to decarbonize heat use in industry and buildings. It is receiving much attention in Japan because of its technical compatibility with existing city gas systems, such as transmission and distribution pipelines and end-use equipment. Also, city gas infrastructure in Japan is relatively resilient to natural disasters, including earthquakes, which is one of the advantages. There is a wide variety of synthetic methane systems. It can be produced in Japan or overseas using international transportation infrastructure. This presentation discusses the preconditions for boosting the deployment of methane synthesis inside Japan from the cost and CO2 procurement viewpoints. Cost competitiveness is crucial for commercialization. We estimated production costs of synthetic methane in the long term in Japan, with different assumptions for renewable electricity cost and capacity factor or full load hours of part two methane facilities. These figures indicate that low cost renewables and High capacity factors of part two methane facilities are critical to reduce the production costs. This estimation also indicates that strong carbon policies are important. As shown in the left hand side figure, 
without carbon price, natural gas is still competitive compared to synthetic methane. While the right hand side figure shows that synthetic methane can be competitive by using low cost renewables like 3 to 5 cents per kilowatt hour. However, procurement of such low cost renewable electricity would be a challenge in Japan. Cost of solar PV has been decreasing but its capacity factor is relatively low. Offshore wind has relatively high capacity factor, but its cost can be a barrier. Another point is the origin of carbon for synthetic fuels. It would matter in achieving net zero emissions. These figures illustrate carbon flow of a synthetic fuel system. The left-hand side system captures CO2 from fossil fuel conversions, while CO2 is from the atmosphere in the right-hand side system. The point is that even when reused, CO2 from fossil fuel conversions will eventually be emitted into the atmosphere these positive emissions need to be offset in a carbon neutral world. In contrast, carbon circulates by utilizing CO2 from biomass conversions or the atmosphere. They are important carbon sources for synthetic fuels. Although biomass potential in Japan can be a barrier and technological developments are necessary for direct air capture. This slide summarizes conclusion. Power 2 methane is a low carbon option that integrates the electricity and heat sectors. But there are some barriers associated with costs and carbon sources in Japan. Research and development and policy supports for reducing cost and optimal system design are important. There would be no silver bullet for Japan to achieve carbon neutrality. This technology would contribute to broadening Japan's mitigation options. Let me briefly explain about the appendix of this presentation. We also conducted a techno-economic assessment on synthetic methane in Japan using an electricity and city gas supply model. This model calculates the cost-optimal power generation mix and city gas supply considering methane synthesis. Simulation results are broadly consistent with the discussions in this presentation. As shown in the panel A, Low-cost renewables combined with strong carbon prices are necessary for synthetic methane to be a part of the optimal solution for Japan. That's all. Thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Otsuki. So let me move to the part of discussion. But uh, time is limited. <laughs> it is scheduled by the time of 10 o'clock in Japan time, it's a closing time. So we have only 16 minutes or so. So I'm afraid there's only one, one round for the <laughs> question and answer. And the basis of the question is uh, what is the technological challenge of sector coupling? And what is the social and economic challenge of energy system integration as I introduced in the introduction. But uh, there is a one question and one comment from the audience. One question is, uh, let me know the role of hydrogen. What is expected to install hydrogen for sector coupling and how to do it is a question. The comment to my understanding. In my understanding is key for managed demand is battery. On the other hand, hydrogen is also useful for energy storage. I think so too. So uh, let me start with uh, uh, Professor Nishimura. Hi. 
you mentioned that uh, demand side flexibility is just in the taking of stage in Japan. So it's a very important timing in Japan to challenge the demand side flexibility. What is the major challenge among uh, that? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the, there are two challenges in Japan's demand side flexibility. One is uh, reserve market. Reserve market is basically in the, uh, co consisted by the uh, uh, legacy fossil fuel generators, basically, and uh, hydro, hydro pumping generators. But uh, it began to combine to the demand side. It will work at the 2024. The system is now on building, and uh, many aggregators and DR players are uh, uh, preparing for joining in. That the so soda in Japan for 2024 is uh, issue one for the demand side flexibility expansion. That's uh, second. Second is the 2032 or 2033. All the uh, feed-in tariff renewable power is uh, ending the uh, uh, fit season, and it is uh, <coughs> it is moved uh, migrated to the uh, sector coupling to the uh, other retail and aggregators. Then there's a huge size of renewable. Uh, volatility is as, as must be sector coupled to the aggregators and the DR. So uh, uh, there, at, uh, the 2032 or 2033 is a dramatically changing intramarket and for the uh, demand side flexibility is matching business. So uh, we are going to tell in the four years after and after 10 years after is uh, uh, a big challenge, so uh, we must prepare for the systems and uh, uh, appliances and other platforms now. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. And next uh, to Mr. Carl Alberto Guglielmo Minotti. And uh, you talked about the vehicle and grid integration, and in, in their business you are doing, it's quite impressive. But uh, how to get money for that? from that business, just frankly. This is my question, personal question to you. Thank you for that. that that's a very interesting question. I mean, uh, this is not a vision, that's the realities of today in Europe. I mean, we first, we are, we are making money out of that, which means uh, essentially being remunerated by the grid operator for the grid services we deliver to the grid, okay? Uh, but we're not talking about pile projects, so we're talking about reality. So less than one year ago, Terna, the largest grid operator in Europe, launched a tender for 250 megawatts of capacity for ultra-fast frequency regulation. So essentially a, a sort of primary reserve, so ancillary services, okay? And um, as NOAA, we have been awarded with 28, one third of, of, the, of the capacity. And uh, for a long term contract for a year, in which we, we, we provide uh, 80 megawatts, 25 of which are provided by electric vehicles. So essentially, our vehicle to grid project is, as of today, 10% of the ultra fast frequency regulation provided to the Italian grid is remunerated like any other assets like coal and gas plants. And uh, we're making money like gas and coal plants, but using electric vehicles, which means that EV users that are charging their vehicles are charging at a lower cost and in some circumstances are charging for free because the charging profile they're using is in line with the capacity required by the grid operator in that specific moment. So this is not a pilot, this is not, a, this is not innovation. This is a, a technology, this was innovation in 2016 when we started developing this technology. As of today, that's a reality. We're talking about hundreds of electric vehicles, we're talking about tens of megawatts, supporting a, a significant portion of the electricity system that is remunerated by one of the largest grid operators in Europe, uh, totally in fully merchant terms, 
with a, with a regulated framework uh, that is supporting for real the grid. So that, that's very simple, the, the business model. Thank you very much, Oda. And next to Dr. Martini. Uh, thank you for your well-organized uh, presentation. Uh, but I'm wondering why you focused on the realization of 100% variable renewable energy. So it's a very hard uh, uh, scenarios. Why not to s expand your scope to the integration of scope using other renewables, other uh, clean energies? That is my simple impression hearing your presentations. How about your comments? I'm sorry, it's mute probably. <laughs> yes, uh, I think, uh, thank you for your question. I think uh, it's the right one. Uh, we wanted to be ambitious. And so when we were thinking about which is could be the level of VRE we can support in our system, we were having a long discussion with all members. Please consider that there are countries that want to have a, a net zero much earlier than expected, not, not to wait to 2050, maybe to be 2045, we heard about California. And today, the uh, British Prime Minister was announcing net zero by 2035 in, in electric system in, in the UK. So I think to do that, you really need to maximize the chances to accommodate a very large share of uh, variable renewable energy sources. Of course, what we believe is that uh, all kinds of clean energy need to be used. They can complement each other. This is a good message I also uh, received from the colleague that was speaking about the use case in California. So it's like a combination of all possible solutions that cooperatively work toward the final goal. And then we want to make a pilot that can be proven working for uh, days or weeks uh, under 100% uh, VRE. And then this will convince policymakers and uh, governments that this is possible in some context, in some specific region. And they will be pushing forward this uh, decarbonization of their system and make uh, innovative solutions available in order to reach that goal. There are countries, as I said, uh, that have a very ambitious plan, and we want to be ambitious as well, making this a very uh, difficult target to be achieved. But we are also several countries working together, and uh, the support of many other partners from the industry side, but also from organizations that are playing their uh, innovation around the world. So this is my answer to your question, but uh, I'm ready to give another one in case you want to continue this debate uh, later on. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Martini. Then uh, Ms. Uh, E.J. Bake. Okay, you explained about the Californian situation, and you should, you say, uh, promote not only renewables, but also nuclear and uh, gas with CCS. It is well balanced, I think. And you pointed out the long duration storage and the flexible demand is important to realize uh, carbon neutrality in California. Uh, it's uh, agreeable, I, I think so too. But uh, my, con my comment or question, what is the optimal combination of various type of clean technologies? Just in your opinion, I like to hear. It, again, it's mute probably. Hi, thank you so much for the question. I think fundamentally it comes down to having a diverse generation set. Uh, the modeling results show that when we allow the system to build some amount of nuclear, CCS, um, hydrogen, long duration storage, and flexible load, it will actually want to do a little bit of everything. So there really aren't clear winners or losers from a system perspective. It's a matter of getting all of those uh, technologies to play very specific roles within the system and helping us get there. Now, that being said, I think all of the technologies that I just mentioned have their own uh, regulations and barriers in getting deployed at scale. And 
For example, California nuclear is probably not going to be proliferated anytime soon. And so that faces a lot more challenges uh, relative to perhaps gas with carbon capture and storage where you know, California has a lot of reservoirs where it can store CO2 very safely. Uh, and there's a lot of potential for flexible demand given the large amount of vehicle integration that's expected. So I think it really depends on the resources that each region has as well as you know, what technologies are best fit for deploying. But ultimately, I, again, to iterate, I think we need all the technologies that we can get and a di diverse set is really the best we can do. Well, thank you very much, EJ. So the, to Dr. Otsuki, you, your talk focused on the methane synthesis, uh, synthesis, synthesized methane, or we call it methanation from recovered carbon dioxide. And uh, you mentioned uh, no silver bullet. I think so too. But uh, you said uh, carbon dioxide recovered from the air or indirectly through uh, biomass. Otherwise, the carbon dioxide itself is emitted to the atmosphere. That is also the case. But uh, uh, to, to, to on this point, I understand, but I think very a bit uh, met meticulous things. You mentioned about the biomass, but you mentioned about the CO2 uh, recovery from biomass combustion, I think. But uh, biomass can be used for making biogas. Biogas, the main compound is uh, methane. So that, how do you think about the using of biogas for the methane? Yes, um, I'm pretty, pretty like, uh, I think the biogas, yes, it's it's very important option as well. But um, I, I know that it's uh, it receives much attention, in, especially in Europe, I think, uh, yeah. But in Japan, um, as I mentioned, like the potential of biomass is relatively limited and, and also focus of biomass is more on in my understanding, its focus of biomass is more on power generation in Japan. So, yes, um, I, I pretty much agree with the concept of the biogas, but from the Japan's perspectives, I think um, the capture from biomass by the power generation could be more f suitable or fitted. That's why I focused on uh, mm -hmm. like synthetic methane from biomass combustion in this presentation. Okay, thank you very much. How about the question from the audience, particularly on the role of hydrogen? Is there any volunteers to respond to the, uh, this question, the role of hydrogen in energy system integration? Okay, uh, Carlo Alberto, please. I, mean, <coughs> I was, uh, first of all, I fully agree with the, all the panelists on the role of flexibility and uh, system integration, the fact, particularly Mrs. Mike, uh, when she was mentioning about the, 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 the importance of the um, of a flexibility mix in terms of different resources, all of them have a, have a different role, and if I may, uh, an important role in decarbonizing. However, I think uh, for, from the technical engineering and scientific perspective, mm -hmm. We have to be very clear on the role of hydrogen. I think that up to 70% of uh, renewables mm. plugged into the electricity system, there is no role for hydrogen. I mean, no role economically, no role from the engineering perspective, because it simply doesn't make any sense to use hydrogen if we want to decarbonize up to 70%. Then if our goal is for real a net zero goal, meaning 100% decarbonization, then in that case, the residual 30% cannot be done with, with batteries in a, an economically viable way. Then exclusively in this situation, hydrogen will play a role, and that will be a fundamental role 
However, we have to be ready to pay for that because the first 70% of the decarbonization is going to decrease electricity tariffs. Mm -hmm. Okay? So essentially today, coupling solar plus storage or wind plus storage is going to decrease the cost for electricity compared to gas and coal, while adding further renewables and coupling hydrogen is fundamental to achieve net zero, but it's going to cost much more than the current electricity mix. That's the perspective from the engineering and, and, the, economic, and the economic perspective, if I may. Okay, thank you very much. And time is already over, <laughs> but uh, okay, let me some concluding remarks or some wrap up. And, and one additional question from the audience, it's a very unique. I think we can use the power of fever in the air. Probably fever is a heat probably. In that case, I, I think a heat pump can be applied for that. Anyway, thank you very much for your uh, participation. The energy system integration or sector coupling is a new idea in energy system structures. So various technologies and various business is now proceeding uh, just to encourage the related person in technology development and the business development to proceed this way. And one additional remark I should say as a moderator, in Secretariat of ICEF is uh, summarizes or selecting innovation cases in each technical, technological session. Related to the energy system integration, there are two innovation cases are selected. One is, uh, uh, you, you know, the next Kraftwerk or a VPP business. And the other is a Hystra, that is a liquefied hydrogen produced in, in a, a foreign in, in the case of Japan, it's uh, South Australia, from brown coal to hydrogen with CCS, it is a blue hydrogen, can be transported to Japan. And in Japan, the uh, ship to transport and accepting facilities are already prepared at the port of Kobe. So these two business cases are selected related to this session. Thank you very much and I will close this session. Thank you very much again.